On the table here, a couple of things you might want to look at during the break. In 1970, one of my graduate students and I did a book on marble, which I'm going to talk about today. And I've got that out here. I've also got a paper done by one of my students on crystal, which we'll talk about today. We talked last time about the greatest skier in the history of the Gunnison country. Everybody remember his name? Easterly. Carl Easterly, with all due respect to Faust. And here he is, a little article I did on him in the paper, which tells you a little bit more about Carl. And then I've got a, a little blurb I did on a mine I'm going to talk about today called the Eureka, which is up on Treasury Peak off of Paradise Divide and Yule Pass. So during the break, if you want to come on in, uh, take a look at those. Uh, Flauschink is coming up on Wednesday evening. I got a slideshow talk at the town, 7 o'clock. It's usually a raucous affair. Uh, 3rd of April at Maxwell's, the polka dance with Pete Dunda. Saturday's the parade when the has-beens go with the uh, newly crowned king and queen. And Sunday, they got beer on the hill as we finish off the ski season and what a lousy season it's been. 191 inches so far, and I think the average is 250. So today, the topic is going to be the north end of the valley. And I want to, you know, last time I left off kind of with Yule Pass, so we're going to start off with that today, and I'm going to situate everybody so we know exactly where we're going. Everybody knows if you go up the head of the Slate River, you come to Paradise Divide, and if you hang a left-hand turn, you go about two and a half miles and go over Yule Pass at 12,200 feet. Named for George Yule, who was the sheriff of Gunnison, and later on they had the Colorado Yule Marble Company down in Marble. Now if you go to the, you stay on the left, you're going to go about eight miles down Yule Creek and you come right into the marble quarries and the town of Marble. It's a fantastic hike. If you go to the right, you're going to go down from Paradise Divide, you're going to go down into Schofield Park. And right after you cross Yule Pass, you're going to go about a half a mile and a road takes you up uh, fairly steep and you're going to come to a big cement structure. And right above that structure is, the tre is Treasury Peak at 13,500 feet. And right on the west end of Treasury Peak is one of the most fantastic mines in the history of the Gunnison country or anywhere else, and I refer to it as the Fantastic Eureka. Eureka obviously means that you find something very pleasurable. And there in the year 1879, they found a silver mine, and that silver mine was very lucrative. But it was a tremendous place to get to. And very early, they had to have a rope that ran from the mine all the way down to, to where you hit the road, or hit the trail at that time, and guys kind of pulled themselves up. It's so steep that when I was up there, I'm, I'm not going up the side of that hill. I don't like heist that much. But one of my runners, a good mountain climber, he went up there at a time when I was there. And uh, there still, there were three buildings up on top. The mine was closed in because it's all iced up. And then in 1949, a guy by the name of Simpson who was from Alamosa, decided to open up the mine. And he hired a guy by the name of Tony Capuchin of Tony's Tavern to go up there with a couple of horses and make a zigzag trail all the way up to the mine, which Tony did. And then they had to have miners up there. They had eight guys working, and they broke away all of the ice in the entrance, and they went in and began to mine. And then, and incidentally, uh, Philip Yaklich's wife was the cook on the base of that for the miners. And it comes out of an interview that I had with Mr. and Mrs. Yaklich in 1971. Ultimately, they built a tram that ran 1,600 feet from the mine down to a big, big cement structure today. That was called the bin. 
and all the oil came to the bin. And they had a tram that ran from the mine to the bin. And it was a gravity tram. The empty cars going down pulled the, or the full cars going down pulled the empty ore cars going up. Gravity tram. And this guy had two Dodge Power Wagons. And he bulldozed a road up the slate all the way to Paradise Divide. And then with those power wagons, he took about 50 loads that came from the bin, 50 loads down into the railhead at Anthracite or Crested Butte. This was in 1949 and 1950. But then the inaccessibility, the tremendous cost of, all, of doing all of this put an end to it in 1950. And there went the Eureka. The most fantastic mine in the history of the Gunnison country. I know of no mine that even came close to 13,455 feet, which is where it was. From the mine to the top of that mountain in very far. So next time you walk over Yule Pass, as you walk down the pass, right after you pass Yule Pass, you're going to see a zigzag road going off to the right. If you walk up that zigzag road, you'll come right to the cement structure, and that was the bin. And then you'll see a cable that goes all the way up to the mine. And if you want to, if you're a little uh, more courageous than I, you walk right up to the mine. Enough on the famous mine called the Eureka. From Eureka now, we're going to come down to Gothic. And I've already covered Gothic. So we're going to make our way north out of Gothic. And as you make your way north out of Gothic, the first place you come to is Avery Peak on the right. Avery Peak campground, everybody is familiar with that. If you continue along the road, you come to road 403. That'll take you, a mountain bike trail or a hiking trail, take you up to the head of Washington Gulch. And then you're going to make your way up to a place called Rustler Gulch. And at Rustler Gulch, they had a town laid out there called Bellevue. Bellevue was laid out in 1880, right where the East River and Rustler Gulch came together. It was named for Mount Bellevue nearby, but it didn't last very long and ultimately was swallowed up by Gothic. Now we're going past Rustler Gulch, heading north. And the next place we come to is Emerald Lake. Named because of the color. A very deep lake. I don't know of anybody who knows exactly how deep it is. Avalanche country on the right side. No trees, all avalanche country. And from there, you make your way past Emerald Lake, and you go one mile further to the north, and you come to the top of Schofield Pass at 10,707 feet. And from the top of Schofield Pass, one of the great mountain bike trails in the world takes off, and that's 401. Whenever my athletes call me, they say, Coach, you've you been on 401? Because what we used to do when I was coaching, on one of our Sunday runs, that was one of our Sunday runs, we'd drive the vans up. Now, don't let this get out. We'd have three vans. Everybody's up at 7.30 in the morning. We're up there about 8.30, ready to roll. And the lead van, I got the lead van, and I come to the top of the pass, and I make a sharp left-hand turn, and I go right up about 20 feet. And everybody's, ooh. And then I back down, and we point them all down towards the way we're going to go out. And everybody hops out, and they jog up to 11,300 feet, which is the top of 401. And I got my mountain bike, and I can't really stay ahead of them. They're too fast for me, even though they're just cruising, because there's some spots on 401 where I got to get off. But the first time, I had to show them. And there they go. And the next time we see the men, it's in downtown Crested Butte in the park. Next time I see the ladies, it's at the Crested Butte ski area. And then we all come into the park, and Vanna Bush has got cinnamon rolls for everybody as we do 10 times 110 strides in the park. And everybody has to answer some trivia questions. Men against the women. Meal money for the next trip on the line. And they're all studying. They got to know something about the area. 
So whenever we went to a very difficult course, such as Slippery Rock, Pennsylvania, probably the most difficult we've ever been on, it is a piece of cake compared to where we run on Sundays. Alpine Tunnel, Flag Creek, Bear Creek, Reno Divide. And one thing I learned, I was never trained as a coach, I learned Sunday runs done at high elevation, just cruising. I don't know what it does, but I mean, it's tremendous. So I learned that. Anything I learned, it didn't work. I threw off to the side. I didn't give a damn what all these other hotshot coaches said. And anything that worked, I kept. Anyway, enough on that. We are now going off of Schofield Pass, going north, and about a mile and a half down Schofield Pass, you come to a left-hand turn. And the left-hand turn takes you to the town of Elko. You're in Elko Basin. And there was a town started there in 1879. And it was started by a guy who placer mined in that area in 1869, and then came back in 1872, Willis McLaughlin. And he continued placer mining throughout the, 19, uh, the 1870s. The town's name came from the Elk Mountains, Elko. Elko began in 1879. By 1881, 300 people were in camp, sawmill, 40-ton concentrator, grocery store, assay office, post office, one great mine after another. And then when Schofield began, everybody pretty mo much moved out of Elko and went to Schofield. If you continue on from Schofield, three miles out of Schofield takes you right up to the top of Paradise Divide. And there you are again in the shadows of Yule Pass, right? So two ways of getting there. One is right up the slate, and the other one is some Gothic hanging a left off of Schofield Pass and going up into Paradise Divide at 11,200 feet at that spot. Now we're continuing to the north. And a little past Elko, on the right side of the road, they got a parking area, and that is the parking area for the West Maroon Pass Trailhead. And that's where people start hiking for Aspen. Now, as you start hiking for Aspen and you're going straight to the east, about two miles up the trail, you'll see a little sign that says Hasley Pass to the left. How many have been over Hasley Pass? Good. And Hasley Pass will take you into the headwaters of the Crystal River. And then Trail Rider Pass, as you go down, will take you up to the headwaters of Snowmass Mountain and Snowmass Creek. And then you drop down and then Buckskin Pass takes you right into Maroon Lake. Four of my women athletes and I, it's 22 miles one way, and you go over three passes at 12,500 feet. Fantastic scenery. If you continue going past Hasley Pass and don't take the turn off, about a mile and a half before you get to West Maroon Pass, you can take a left-hand turn and go to Frigid Air Pass. How many have been to Frigid Air? Now, for me, that is the most beautiful spot that I have ever been in the Gunnison country. Because you're looking right into Favorite Basin and the backside of the Maroon Bells. Spectacular. If you don't take Frigid Air Pass, you work your way up to 12,400 foot high West Maroon Pass, and then you drop down Maroon Creek and come past Crater Lake and into the Maroon Lake and into the Maroon Bells area, and there is the number one photograph in all of Colorado, people taking a picture of Maroon Lake with the Maroon Bells in the background. And then you catch the bus and go on into Aspen. Did I tell you guys about Jack Nicholson, that story about Nicholson last time? No? No, oh, good, I'll tell you, and I probably blew it. <laughs> this is a true story. A guy named Jim Greer was an outfitter. Later on, worked in, uh, as uh, one of our financial guys at Western State. He's taking a group over to Aspen over West Maroon Pass. And they get over West Maroon Pass on horseback, and one of the horses had a loose shoe. So he said, you guys catch the bus, I'll take the horses, and I'll get the shoe put back on. 
as you go down to Aspen on the left side of the road, they got a ranch there where reindeer are on the roof. Anybody seen that? That's where they, that's where they were. He said, I'll catch a ride and I'll meet you wherever we're staying. And uh, so he gets the horse all shooed, taken care of. Here comes a guy with a Harley Davidson and Greer's out there hitchhiking. The guy picks him up. And on the way in, Greer says, my name's Jim. And I gave this away already. The other guy says, my name's Jack. So they go into Aspen and Greer says, you know, I really appreciate this. Could I buy you a beer? And the guy says, yeah, let's go down to the Hotel Jerome and have a beer. The guy parks his Harley Davidson right in front of a fire hydrant in a yellow parking zone. <laughs> and they go in and they have a couple of beers and everybody who walks into the Hotel Jerome bar seems to know this guy. And finally, the guy turns over to Greer and he says, say, he says, you don't know who the hell I am, do you? And Jim Greer says, no, I really don't. And the guy says, I'm Jack Nicholson. And Greer said, so? <laughs> Never heard of him. <laughs> who the hell's Jack Nicholson? Nicholson thought this was fantastic. They had another beer. <laughs> now, Nicholson gives about 50 grand a year to the fire and police department. He is the only man allowed to park that Harley Davidson right out in front of a fire hydrant and in a yellow zone. Nobody bothers him. All right, now we've taken care of West Maroon Pass. And we are now continuing for two miles right through beautiful Schofield Park. And as we drop down off the edge of north end of Schofield Park, you're going to cross a bridge with a waterfall. And on the right side, that was the big Schofield smelter. The town of Schofield is located right at the north end of the park. And give me a moment here, I got a whole bunch of stuff laid out. So Schofield is laid out in 1879 by a man by the name of B.F. Schofield. That's why they called it Schofield. Get to my notes here. Uh, laid out kind of in the shadows of Schofield Pass, not too far away, at 10,707 feet. And it became one of the great silver towns in the Gunnison country when it opened up in 1879. Schofield, at its peak, had 1,000 people, 1,000 prospectors, and get this, 50 frame buildings. We've all been to Schofield, right? You go by there today, you say, no way. 50 frame buildings, two stores, four saloons, two restaurants, three real estate offices, one livery stable, one jail, a post office, and a three-story Elk Mountain Hotel. So next time you go by Schofield, as they say, we want some damn respect. The big mines of the area, Pride of the West, Oxford Bell, South Pole, and the Shakespeare. U.S. Grant visited Schofield, went through Gothic, we all know that, kept right on going through Schofield, Crystal, and down in to Carbondale. One of the most famous people ever in the Schofield area was Captain Ellen Jack who later on wrote a book about her experiences called Fate of a Fairy. Fate of a Fairy. She was born in England in 1842 and married a, an English naval officer named Charles Jack. And they had three children, had four children. Three died along with her husband. She came to America, left one kid with relatives in New York and went out west to see if she could make some money. She came to Colorado with diamonds, government bonds, and a 44 pistol. Her best investment was the famous Black Queen mine near Crystal. And she recounted all these stories, and she, you know, obviously exaggerated. She's in gunfights, she's finding great mines, she's knocking out guys who try to accost her, etc. She died in 1921 at the age of 72. Schofield began to fade in 1883. It didn't work out very well because of the low-grade ore. In 1885, the post office closed and the population moved to Crystal. 
It revived temporarily in 1899 when some Aspen men came and reopened the Whopper and North Pole mines. They fixed up the old mill and operated the old mill for a while and employed 50 men, but 1900, Schofield closed for good. That takes care of Schofield. Now we're by Schofield, we're down past the mill, another mile and a half through the willows, and we come to the head of the feared, and I say it softly, Devil's Punch Bowls <laughs> and the Crystal Canyon. And there, that road was built from Crystal up to Crested Butte in 1883, hacked out of the side of a mountain. That's Crystal Canyon, Devil's Punch Bowls, a feared road indeed, and that is where all of the ore from crystal and the marble from marble came up for a long time and went up into Crested Butte. In the year 1971, a professor from the University of Illinois named Alan Robinson had a new jimmy that he had bought, 62 miles on it, had been down in Marble, came back from Marble heading for Crested Butte. It was raining very badly. And he said that the road gave way, which is a lie. That road is a very, very good road. But he went off the side of the road and into the Crystal River, and nine people out of the 12 in the vehicle died, and one has never been found. Three months later, a Jeep went off near Emerald Lake, went into the lake, and three more people died. So inside of about 10 miles on that road in three months, 12 people died in the year 1971. Now the Devil's Punch Bowls are fantastic. And now we make our way past the Devil's Punch Bowls. And we're going down towards Crystal. And before we get to Crystal, there comes the North Fork of the Crystal River into the Crystal. And right there was a town called Snowmass City. And Snowmass City was started in the year 1884. General store, saloon, 20 cabins, and a 10-string band and 100 miners. People go by there today, say, no way. But now we're going by Snowmass City. It didn't last very long. Most of those people moved into Crystal. And now for about five miles, from Schofield, we come all the way down the Crystal River, and we come right down into the town of Crystal. 9,000 feet, right on the banks of the Crystal River, opened up as a silver mining camp in the year 1879. And the most famous resident, obviously, was Al Johnson. We've all heard of him. As Brother Fred, San Laurentian Mountains, French Quebec, Canada, Members of the Crystal Snowshoe Club, the famous club of the Rockies, postmaster, owner of the general store, and mail carrier in between Crested Butte and Gunnison. Going through the Devil's Punch Bowl by Emerald Lake. You can imagine the trip that he had to make many times. Crystal not only was the home of the Crystal Snowshoe Club. It was also the home of the Crystal Club. And every weekend, the men would go to the Crystal Club, and they would talk about business, and they'd drink a little bit, and, and the women were very suspicious about what went on in the Crystal Club. And one weekend, they demanded that they be allowed to come, even though it was for men only. And some of the guys who were unmarried didn't like it. And while a dance was going on, you know, when I grew up, and certainly back in those days, the women sat on a bench on this side of the room, and the men sat on a bench on this side of the room. And when you want to dance, you walk up to the young lady and say, Ma'am, could I have this dance? If I, what's your first name? Rosalind. Rosalind, could I have this dance? Maybe I know her just a little bit. She said, Let me check my card. You're number seven. Seventh song comes up, I go over, we dance. Now the women are on one side, and one of the young men, while the women are dancing, went over and sprinkled itching powder on the bench. 
The women all left at 9 o'clock, more suspicious than ever about what went on in Crystal. Crystal Club. The great mines of Crystal were the Lead King. In fact, if you go up the North Fork, you go into Lead King Basin, Lake Geneva, Little Gem Lake, and then in the shadows of Snowmass Peak. The Lead King, the Bell of Titusville, the Whopper, and the Black Queen, the big one. Right past Crystal by 200 yards, on the left side of the Crystal River, on the west side of the Crystal River, you see the, the second most photographed spot in all of Colorado, and that is the Crystal Mill. And everybody, you know, we call it Dead Horse Mill, and they think maybe it was a power mill, uh, a uh, sawmill, nothing of the sort. Inside of that mill was a 90 horsepower turbine water wheel. And water, there was a lake there. They built up a lake right around it. And water running downhill creates power, you know, spins the water wheel, generator powered on the side of the water wheel. And then you had lines running across the road, and compressed air was shot through these lines to run the Bell of Titusville, the Inez, and the Sheep Mountain Tunnel on the other side of the road. It's a power mill. It opened up in 1893, and it ended in 1917. Outside of the Maroon Bells, that is the most photographed spot in all of Colorado. And fortunately, in 1976, during the centennial of Colorado, a new roof was put on it, and they've still been adding on to it since. Here is a quote. There the waters dash over a ledge of rocks. At this admirable spot is the powerhouse of the Sheep Mountain Tunnel from which power is supplied to the three mines, the Sheep Mountain, the Inez, and the Sheep Mountain Tunnel. A turbine water wheel generates a 90 horsepower propelling force which operates the air compressor. The compressed air is carried through pipelines to air drills used to penetrate the solid rock. Have I talked to anybody in this group about Nikola Tesla yet? No. Well, here's a good time to talk about Nikola Tesla. And I'm going to tell you something that is world famous. Go tell your ride, Colorado, near tell your ride, Colorado. In the year 1890, a fellow named Louis Nunn owned the Gold King Mine outside of Telluride. And it was costing him $2,500 a month to get coal up to that mine to power it. And it was a good paying mine. And he was looking for a cheaper source of power. And as a result, he contacted. George Westinghouse of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, who was tinkering around with a new type of motor. And he also contacted the most brilliant man in electricity who has ever lived. Nobody today has ever been able to duplicate what this guy was able to do. Nikola Tesla, a Czechoslovakian or a Czech immigrant. Have you ever seen a movie, The Prestige? Has anybody seen The Prestige? Nikola Tesla's in the Prestige, Colorado Springs, blew out the power supply, blew out all the lights in Colorado Springs, one of his experiments. <laughs> and the other guy that Louis Nunn contacted was his brother Paul Nunn. And Paul Nunn was studying engineering at Ohio State University, the only engineering school in the nation at that time. So here's the situation. Down below the Gold King Mine, 2,500 feet, is a little town called Ames. And at Ames, the Trout Lake Fork of the San Miguel River and the Ofer Fork of the San Miguel River coming off of Ofer Pass join right there. So what they did was they built a frame building the old, the, it's still there today. I'll tell you a quick story about that later. And they built it, a, put a water wheel inside with cups on it. Water coming downhill from the two forks hit the water wheel cups and spun it. They belted a generator to it. And then 
They put towers all the way up to the Gold King Mine, and they strung on top of the towers lightweight copper wire. Up until this time, the only kind of current that operated for commercial or industrial purposes was direct current from Thomas Edison. The problem with direct current is it doesn't run very far because it loses its voltage. And you'd have to have a powerhouse every 300 yards to get power that far uphill. What Louis Nunn and Paul Nunn and Nikola Tesla and George Westinghouse, however, did was put in a motor, the first alternating current motor in history at the Gold King Mine for industrial purposes, and then they threw the switch down below at the Ames Power Plant. And power surged at 186,000 miles a second right up to the alternating current motor at the Gold King Mine and power was now operating at the Gold King. That is the first use of alternating current electricity in history in the world, beating the Lauberhorn experiments two months later in Germany. Thomas Edison was no fan of Tesla, and Tesla didn't like Edison. And Edison claimed that alternating current electricity would kill anybody who went up against it. Nikola Tesla blew that out of the water by standing in his shop one day and turning blue with one current of electricity after another passing through his body and nothing happened. And the reason Edison wanted direct current was he had big financial investment in direct current. Now direct current works well in subways, works well in cities, but not in running electrical lines long distances. Do we have electrical lines that run thousands of miles today? you damn right, and without, without alternating current electricity, not going to run. Lightning in his hand, the great book by, about Nikola Tesla. Lightning in his hand. Died in the 1940s, could, couldn't get along with people very well. Greatest mind in electricity you ever lived. I'm there giving a talk one time. They, they come in, they let us see the generator. It still works. It's part of the Colorado Ute Electrical Association. And I'm standing there giving a talk, and there's a guy outside of the door, and finally I went up and introduced myself. He says, sir, uh, you know, you work here? Yeah, he says, I work here. He says, I'm just hanging around, make damn sure you're telling the right story. <laughs> Ames Power Plant, world famous. So that's what we have now in the Gunnison country, in some of these areas I've been talking about, and certainly at Crystal, same situation. Crystal, I think I gave you the number of people, about a thousand people, ultimately by the year 1885, low grade ore, long winters, isolation, mark the end of Crystal. Faded. Today, going to Crystal today, there are a couple of families that live there. And the county commissioners deliberately have not improved that road. And they haven't improved it down into Crystal through the Devil's Punch Bowl because the people at Crystal don't want every damn Tom, Dick, and Harry going through the town. Built in 1883. Lyle McNeil, Whitey Sporsich, and a construction gang from Crested Butte in the 1950s put a bridge in over the river, improved the road. I've been up and down that thing a hundred times, sometimes at night, but in a lot better shape than it is today. Today there's no bridge, and right below the bridge you can see a flattened car right on the bottom of the Crystal River. So you better know what you're doing if you go down the Crystal River. Five miles down the Crystal River, five miles from the town of Crystal, we come to one of the most unique and most famous towns in the United States, and that is Marble. 7,908 feet. As you come into Marble, 
on the right side of the road, Sheep Mountain. On the left side of the road, White House Mountain, which is all Leadville limestone and the greatest deposit of pure white marble in the world, in the world. The Crystal River Valley, for a long time, everybody said there was a jinx because no town in the Crystal River Valley made it. It lasted a while and then died out. In fact, there is a book with the title, Crystal River Valley, The Jinx. Placer miners were in marble along the banks of the Crystal River very early, but many of them were killed and the others were driven out by Ute Indians on whose land they were placer mining. One man named John Gant went through there in 1859 down the crystal and he found rusting mining tools that he said were probably 50 to 100 years old, which meant that Spain probably had been in that area long before the first white man ever was. In 1873, as I mentioned a little earlier in this class, Sylvester Richardson, one of the town fathers of Gunnison, made his way along the Parsons expedition. They were looking at the geology and geography of the Gunnison country. When the Parsons expedition went back to Denver, Richardson stayed and walked 600 miles all alone in the Gunnison country during the late summer and fall of 1873. And he found the marble deposits. And he found the coal deposits. And he learned a lot about the geography and the geology. So all these marble deposits were known very early. Then came the Hayden Survey from 1873 to 76. And one of Ferdinand Hayden's men, William Holmes, talked about a tremendous mudslide that came down Carbonate Creek and ran right out into the Crystal River in 1874. Keep that in mind. We're going to be back to it momentarily. Marble was laid out by two men, a man named William Woods and William Perry, in 1881 as a silver town. There was an adjoining town that was in competition with it for 11 years, and that town's name was Clarence. When Marble got the post office in 1892, they merged under the name of Marble. John C. Osgood owned main owner of the Colorado Fuel and Iron Company, main owner of the Denver and Rio Grande Railroad, John C. Osgood is the guy who built up Redstone in the famous Redstone Castle. In 1893, John C. Osgood took a marble exhibit over to the World's Columbian Exposition, 1893. And when he showed that pure white marble, the next year, orders came in one after another and the reason they came in was that the number one marble mining area in the world the Carrera mining company of Italy they were losing all their marble they were, they were kind of played out the mine was playing out so here we got another area where you can get that pure white marble Leadville limestone site of White House Mountain in the 1890s Two years later, Marble got the contract for the interior of the Colorado State Capitol. 140,000 square feet of marble. So you go to the Capitol today, and the inside of the Capitol is, is Gunnison Marble. The outside of the Capitol is Aberdeen Granite from right outside of Gunnison. Gail, raise your hand. We are very honored to have Representative Gail Schwartz with us tonight. Gail has just been appointed to the Upper Colorado River, Gunnison. the Gunnison Water Board with uh, Kathleen Curry. And uh, so she's going to closet us out with Rosman here. They're going to talk water a little bit later on. I hope I get to it today. If I knew you were coming, I'd have baked a cake. <laughs> We'd have stopped and I talked about water. In any case, the whole capital is built out of Gunnison Country stone. Granite on the outside, marble on the inside. The stone was taken by sled in the winter, almost four miles from the quarry openings to the mill down below. 
By 1897, five quarry openings existed on the flank of White House Mountain, and the workers couldn't take all the time to go down in the marble and live and then come back up the next day, so they built a whole series of shacks above the quarry openings, and those shacks became known as Quarry Town. And that's where the miners working in the marble quarries stayed at night. Marble took off when a guy named Channing Meek came to town, M-E-E-K, and he started a company called the Colorado Yule Marble Company. He was the owner of Shredded Wheat. He was the owner of the American Biograph Company. And he now built the largest finishing mill in the world, 1,742 feet long and 100 feet wide. One-third of a mile long, football field is 300 feet, six football fields long and 100 feet wide, down in the town of Marble. Spent $3 million for that, the quarries and transportation. Marble initially took stone from the quarries 3.9 miles away from the town, in a, took the marble down there in nine horse-drawn wagons in the summer. So you had horses pulling nine different wagons, you know, and obviously different teams, but nine wagons pulling the marble down. In the wintertime, they went down in sleds. The quarries openings that produced marble, the marble went down in sleds. After that, a steam tractor was used. Now, I got a picture of that steam tractor. Eight-foot-high steel wheels. Unbelievable. The guy inside looks like a midget. And now that steam tractor is pulling four wagons with 20 tons of marble in each wagon down that road 3.9 miles down to the mill below. And then later on, Channing Meek would build an electric tram. In 1906, the Crystal River and San Juan Narrow Gauge Railroad ran from Carbondale into Marble. And Marble got its first railroad, and now they could get rid of that marble. The Crystal River in San Juan was not always the most reliable railroad. It was known as the Can't Run and Seldom Jumps Railroad. And it went to a place called Carbondale. And when you go through Carbondale today, people, carbon means coal, right? And Dale means valley. Coal Valley. Right where two streams come together, the Crystal River running right into the Roaring Fork River. And from Carbondale downstream, it runs in, the Roaring Fork runs into the Colorado at one of the most beautiful towns on the western slope, Glenwood Springs, and the home of the Hotel Colorado. The steam tractor gave way to Channing Meeks' electric tram, which he built in 1910. It was faster, but a lot more dangerous as it navigated a 17% grade. So you got marble loaded on cars, electrically controlled, going down a 17% grade, taking it down to the mill below. The way that you got the marble out of the quarries, initially, I hate to even say this, they used dynamite. Very wasteful way. Later on in the wintertime, they used something called plug and feathers. And plug and feathers meant that you drilled into the marble and then you fill that hole with water and when the water froze, it broke the marble. Plug and feathers. Later on, they used wire saws called channeling machines. That's why on the outside of the marble in the quarries, it's kind of dirty because of the friction caused by these wire machines. Down below, right outside of the mill, Marble built a 65-foot retaining wall. 
because avalanches came off of White House Mountain and they didn't want these avalanches to hit the mill. So it hit this 65 foot high retaining wall and the snow kicked right over the mill or right in front of the mill. I'd love to have seen it, I don't have a picture of it. The miners rode the tram up and down. By now they didn't have to live in Quarry Town, they could live down in Marble, so to go to work they rode it up. And then to go down, they skied down. Colorado's first toll, the electric tram of Marble. In 1903, a big fire occurred in New Jersey, and it showed that while granite crumbled with intense heat, marble didn't. And that led to tremendous orders coming into marble after 1903. By 1912, this is legitimate now, Colorado Business Directory, 1,800 people lived in Marble. That's about 300 more that live in Crested Butte today. And Marble was turning out mausoleums, monuments, and stone for over 400 public buildings in the United States, including many courthouses and public schools. This is an unbelievable operation. Most of the people who came to work in marble were from Greece and Italy, skilled workers working in the mill, carving out all these things that were now going to be sent all over the United States. One of the most famous residents in marble was a red-haired, six-foot-tall, 165-pound woman named Sylvia Smith who had edited the Crested Butte Weekly Citizen in Crested Butte before, but now was running the Marble Times. She was a muckraker. My father visited a meatpacking plant one time, never ate lunch meat the rest of his life. In Upton Sinclair's The Jungle, this is true. In meatpacking plants, once in a while, an individual would fall into the vat and be absolutely incinerated with a hot, a hot fat. Came out part of the lunch meat. Flies that we sprayed went into the vat, came out lunch meat. Spit and sawdust and tobacco juice on the floor into the lunch meat. When Upton Sinclair wrote The Jungle, he said, I tried to get the American people through their brains, but he said, I got to them through their stomachs. <laughs> and the Meat Inspection Act was passed the following year. And that's why today, meat inspectors go in, grade A, stamp, grade whatever it is. Can you imagine mad cow disease or something like that coming? Sylvia Smith was a mug raker. She didn't like the Colorado Yule Marble Company. She didn't like the CF&I, and she didn't like the railroad because they charged high rates, and they had watered stock, and they were cheating people. But the town's existence depended on the Colorado Yule Marble Company. And as a result, in 1912, Sylvia Smith had a petition of 232 names signed to get her out of town. She refused. She was lodged in jail overnight, and then the next day physically put on a train out of town with the admonition never to come back. She sued and won a settlement of $52,000, and everybody in town had to pay. Anybody who signed the damn petition had to pay. Died in 1927, one of the most courageous newspaper editors we ever had in her great years were in Marble. Marble's peak years came between 1910 and 1916 when 1,800 people were in town. From 1914 to 16, Marble got the contract to provide stone for the Lincoln Memorial. Forty trains of 15 cars each, each one carrying 50 to 70,000 pounds of marble, left on the Colorado, on the Crystal River and San Juan Railroad, tied in to 
to the either the Denver Rio Grande or the Colorado Midland, and then went all the way out to Washington, D.C. Now, you got a narrow gauge railroad if you tie it into the Colorado Midland, and eventually the Rio Grande got broad gauge. Narrow gauge, three feet wide, broad gauge, four feet eight and a half. Later on, they got a third rail at Salida. And also in Glenwood Springs, they had what they called a barrel roller. And a barrel roller physically picked up a narrow gauge car, tipped it upside down, dumping all the contents into a broad gauge car, and then put it back on the tracks. That is called a barrel roller. And that's what happened with the Rio Grande and Salida, because the Rio Grande eventually broad gauged their track. Some of the rails had a third rail. You had a narrow gauge, and then you had another rail out here, one foot eight and a half inches, and you could run a narrow gauge and a broad gauge on the same track. So all this marble went out to Washington, D.C. in the Lincoln Memorial. That's when most of the Greek and Italian workers were brought in, because they were skilled workmen. A fire in 1925, well, let's just precede that a little bit. A fire in 1925 caused $500,000 damage to the mill. By that time in the 1920s, no matter what you hear about the Roaring Twenties people, the Roaring Twenties were roaring for about the upper 5% of the population. The other 95% it was pretty much a depression. And there were a lot of orders that went unfilled because marble just didn't have the market anymore. So things were kind of going downhill. Distance, isolation, and then structural steel was replacing marble. Marble is a porous stone. And as industry came in and pollution came, the white marble began to turn black. And you had to go in there and sandblast it. And eventually you said to hell with it and you used structural steel. So all of this was occurring. And then in 1925 came that big fire. In the late 1920s, the Vermont Marble Company bought the Colorado Yule Marble Company out. And two years later, got a contract for supplying marble for the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. So in the late 1920s and early 1930s, they searched for a pure white block of marble. And in the year 1931, they found it. And the Vermont Marble Company sent in a special hoist. And the hoist was anchored to the ground and dropped ropes 125 feet to the bottom of the quarry where the block was cinched in the ropes and then lifted about 15 feet up and allowed to hang in the ropes to see if anything would happen. When it didn't happen, they began to inch it out 125 feet straight up. 126 ton block of pure white marble. Biggest block of stone ever quarried. Came up to the top into a clear blue Colorado sky. Was, low, was put on a rail car on that tram. And then with log skids in the back and log skids in the front, very carefully made its way 3.9 miles down to Marble, four days to go there. Less than a mile a day to get down to Marble. Located on the railroad, taken to Proctor, Vermont, and cut into 56 tons and placed at Arlington National Cemetery, 1931, as the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. Then came the Depression, and again marble going downhill. And then unfortunately in 1941, if you remember William Holmes talking about that big mudslide coming down Carbonate Creek in 1874, on August the 8th, 1941, a tremendous slide came down Carbonate Creek and hit the middle of marble. 
cutting a 1,000-foot swath through the community. Debris piled up to 20 feet as rocks and logs and mud piled up in the middle of the town. Only the bandstand and the fire tower were left standing. 1945, another tremendous slide hit, worse than the first one, but by then hardly anybody lived in marble. That's the problem with marble even today. Marble remained isolated after 1945 with a few people and tourists. When I first came in the early 1960s, Mrs. Teresa Francis had a pop stand selling postcards and selling pop. The good days, I told you last time, were all gone and we're bound for moving on. And then, in the 1970s, a group of developers had a planned unit development of 33,000 people in marble, complete with a ski area off the side of Mount Daly. Now yours truly is one of the only people I ever know to ski there, chairlift, because the Gunnison County Commissioners put the kibosh to this immediately because the ski area is located in an avalanche area, a mudslide area, and the same thing with the town. So it never got off the ground. And the ski area never survived. A little later on, in the 1990s, a group of investors got together and they began to open up the marble quarries. One of the guys that I'd met, and I can't remember his name, darn it, and I'll get it next time, unfortunately was killed in a car accident in South Park, put this together, and they began to mine marble out of the marble quarries again in the 1990s, and they still are today. They have built a new road up to just about where the quarries are, and big trucks take the marble down. They have, waiting down in the town of Marble, another block of pure white marble that is going to be the next Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. Because the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier in Arlington has got a big crack in it. Somebody at Marble has already agreed to pay for taking the marble to D.C. The marble owners have paid for the marble. It's not going to cost the government anything. But the government, they say, says, it's got to go out for bid. <laughs> what the hell do you mean it's got to go out for bid? There isn't another area in the world that's got a pure white marble block like that. When I was working on Marble, I knew Charlie and Marge Orlowski, who had been there forever, and there was a secret entrance that you could get into one of the quarries. And many a day, many a happy day, I was there with my hockey stick and puck in the wintertime because it was one of the greatest ice rinks you ever wanted to see. And I could still hear the echoes off the puck as it hit the side of the quarry walls. One of the most unique things you could ever do and they got a big cable right in front of the big quarry opening. And in the old days, marble children used to grab the cable and swing out and swing back. 125 foot drop if anything happened. 125 foot drop if that cable didn't get back. Of course, before they swung out, they pulled it out as far as they could and way out and then way back. More guts than I would have to do something like Marble, as all of you people know, is in Gunnison County. It's got a school. It's got a post office. It's got a historical society. And it's got about 100 year-round residents. And it's filled with tourists in the summertime today. There's the north end of the valley. We're now taking five minutes. It's five after eight. Promptly ten after eight. We're talking about water. Good to have you here. I'm delighted. All right, folks, here we go. The next 16 minutes is on the number one most important thing in the history of the West and today. And the second most important thing would need a telescope to see this one. That's how important it is. 
So I'll start off with Stephen Long and Zebulon Pike. We're going to go way back. Zebulon Pike was sanctioned by the U.S. government to take a look at the southern reaches of the newly purchased Louisiana Territory. And he worked his way, as all of you people know, if you go to Salida and make your way from Poncha Springs up to Leadville and Buena Vista, you see a little sign on the side of the road. And if you stop and take a look at it, it says, Zebulon Pike killed a buffalo here on Christmas Day in 1806. So he's all over Colorado. And when he came back, he said, most of the area I have been in is a desert. Thirteen years later, Stephen Long of the Yellowstone Expedition made his way in the west. And it was supposed to go up the Missouri River and do all kinds of classic things, but the river was low that year, and he never made it all the way up to the Yellowstone. But he did go on the Platte River and come up into Colorado and got a good look at Long's Peak. Both of those individuals, especially Stephen H. Long, referred to the area that he had been in as, quote, the great American desert. And from that time on, every map that any kid looked at in the United States had dots on it in the middle part of the country. Eastern Colorado, Kansas, Nebraska, South and North Dakota, Northern New Mexico, dots. And everybody later on said, how could those guys have been so wrong? And ladies and gentlemen, they weren't wrong. Fit that area, they said, was fit for jackrabbits, rattlesnakes, prairie dogs, and wild Indians, but certainly not fit for human habitation. And they were the earliest guys to hit it right on the nose. That area is a near desert. And now we come to the year 1867. I think we talked about this maybe a little earlier, maybe not. Did I tell you people about the great surveys of the American West? Well, you're going to get it right now. 1867 to 1879, the United States government financed four expeditions in the West. First scientific look at the West. Pike, Long, Lewis and Clark, Gunnison, Fremont, all these guys really didn't discover very much of the West because they were right, went right through the area after one day. The only guys that really knew about it were the mountain men, and they didn't write about it. So now we're going to take a scientific look at the West and, and eliminate some of these ridiculous rumors. Hot water bubbling 100 feet into the air. Everybody knew that was a damn lie. Indians living in the side of cliffs. Everybody knew that was a damn lie. A wild river that everybody knew where it headed, but nobody knew where it went to. Everybody knew that was a damn lie. So here was the first scientific survey of the American West. Ferdinand Van de Veer Hayden, the guy who named Crested Butte and Gothic. First guy to take a look at Mesa Verde. Clarence Rivers King, first head of the United States Geological Survey and the exposer of a diamond hoax in northwestern Colorado. George Montague Wheeler, whose man, William Marshall, trying to get from Santa Fe to Denver to get an abscess tooth taken care of, desperately tried to get a shorter route and found a low depression in the mountains he had been over a little before, and today that is known as Marshall Pass for William Marshall, paralleling Monarch Pass, and the great John Wesley Powell. John Wesley Powell expedition down the Colorado River, 1869, first man ever to go, one-armed explorer, lost an arm at Shiloh during the Civil War, Ten men with them. Three got out late in the game. They got very afraid. They could hear the roar of the water, and they were killed by Indians as they came out. Powell and his men made it to the Virgin River and got, were safe. 
Two years later, Frederick Delenbaugh, the second trip down the Colorado River in a great book written called The Canyon Voyage. John Wesley Powell, in the 1870s, after all this activity, would write a report that is the most famous report ever written on the American West. He understood the West like nobody before or after ever did, and all of our politicians ought to have the opportunity to read it. It's called Arid Regions of the West, a report on the arid regions of the West, and here is what John Wesley Powell said. Number one, he said, the resources of the American West are not inexhaustible. There is not plenty more where that came from, and if we don't take care of our resources, we're going to eliminate them. So we better take care of the timber, we better take care of the water, and we better take care of all the other resources, including the flora and the fauna and the animals. First conservationist in the history of the West. Number two, said Powell, the land in much of the West is not suitable for farming. Nobody should farm it. The natural way of making a living in the Great Plains is ranching. Thirteen million buffalo existed on the high grass of the Great Plains for a million years. Cows ought to be able to do the same. And from 1865 to 1888, one of the greatest industries in the history of the United States unfolded, and that was the cattle industry on the plains and in the American West. We still got people in New York City wearing cowboy boots, cowboy hats, cowboy clothing, Western music, mama. Don't let your babies grow up to be cowboys. <laughs> hey, won't you play another somebody done somebody wrong song. Please, Mr. Please, don't play B-17. It was our song. I'm teary, I'm getting teary-eyed already. <laughs> You're the reason God made Oklahoma. And I'm sure missing you. Santa Monica Freeway makes a country girl blue. You're the reason God made Oklahoma, and I'm sure missing you. They're all about trucks, dead people, lost loves, tragedy. The taxi's waiting, it's blowing his horn. It's the name of that song. Leaving on a jet plane by John Denver. Already I'm so lonesome I could die. Well, if you're so damn lonesome, don't leave. <laughs> the philology, the customs, the traditions, the language, the everything put together, the folk spirit of a people existed in the American West. And then in 1888, it was all over. Two back-to-back, -back, tremendous winters wiped out three-quarters of the cattle in the United States. Anybody see a movie called Lonesome Dove or see the TV series? Tommy Lee Jones is playing a guy named Clyde Goodnight, one of the great cattlemen ever, taking those cows up to a new range in Montana. Number three, so I digress. Number three, said John Wesley Powell. The land in much of the West, if farmed, must have access to irrigation. Nobody is going to make it by dry farming. You better, you better be next to a river, or you can use the high wind of the prairie 10 to 12 miles an hour on the average, on the average, Oklahoma where the wind comes sweeping down the plains, and you use that windmill to pump water out of underground aquifers. If you got water, then you might be able to farm otherwise, no. Number four, said Powell, the Homestead Act, giving people 160 free acres of the public domain in the West, 
When I say free, I mean $34 registration fee, and you had to agree to live on the land for five years and make improvements on it, and then you got the land for nothing. 160 acres in the West wouldn't handle one damn cow. It might do it out in Illinois, Wisconsin, or Michigan, but not out on the Great Plains. So the Homestead Act is irrelevant. Doesn't work. A bunch of guys in Washington, D.C. didn't know anything about the American West. Number five, there is only one agency in the United States big enough and with enough money to finance reservoirs and gigantic irrigation projects. And that's the federal government. And the federal government was looked upon as a friend to all the people of the West at that time. Paid money for Indian protection, subsidized railroads, built gigantic irrigation projects, set the price of gold and silver high enough to where guys who were trespassing on government land could make it. The only difference between the federal government today and the federal government then, people, is that the federal government today has to be all things to all people. John Rosman, I would say, does not want some damn mountain bike trail going through his property. <laughs> Mark Schumacher at Three Rivers Resort wants a lot of water coming down the Taylor River so those 20,000 people he and Scenic River Tours take down the Taylor River every year get a good ride. They want some rapids. Schmidt here is a fly fisherman. He doesn't want white water. Everybody wants something from the federal government. John Wesley Powell, if he was here today, would say, and I want everybody to go right along with me now, we're going to give three cheers for the federal government. Hip, hip! <laughs> Dead silence. And everybody looks at me and says, what the hell are you talking about? Hip, hip, hooray for the federal government. As I tell my class once in a while, when I say the Roman Empire, when Rome was a little village on the banks of the Tiber River, like Gunnison, in 300 years became the number one civilization in the world. I say that's like Gunnison becoming the number one civilization in the world in 200, 300 years. And some of my people are on their cell phones saying, get a hold of the mental health center, he's at it again. <laughs> John Wesley Powell became the father of government bureaus. United States Geological Survey. Bureau of Land Management, Soil Conservation Service, Bureau of Mines, and the Bureau of Reclamation. Do we have examples of the Bureau of Reclamation in the Gunnison country? You bet your sweet bippy we do. It's called the Blue Mesa Dam, the Crystal Dam, and the Morrow Point Dam, and Glen Canyon, and Grand Coulee, and the Peck Dam, and the Bonneville Dam and the Hoover Dam, all, B, all Bureau of Reclamation projects. Don't knock the federal government. Don't knock it unless you tried it, they say. Federal government, no, I'm not in here pitching for the federal government. <laughs> I'm just paying, playing the devil's advocate. Gail Schwartz, you probably get a little complaints out in the state legislature, right? Darn right you do. And then a great book written in the year 1931, I'll finish off because we're getting out of time. A University of Texas young professor named Walter Prescott Webb read a book called The Way West by Emerson Huff. And Emerson Huff in this book on the West said that the West had been settled by the axe, the boat, the horse, and the rifle. Walter Prescott Webb said, it may have been settled by the horse and the rifle, but it sure as hell wasn't settled by the axe because there's no timber in the Great Plains, and it wasn't settled by the boat because there's no navigable rivers in that area. And Walter Prescott Webb went on to write one of the greatest books in historiography in American history. It was called The Great Plains. 
in which he gave 10 geographic characteristics of the Great Plains. And his major point was anybody crossing the Mississippi River and trying to farm in the Great Plains had to understand that they were now in an area that demanded that everything had to be different. Couldn't operate like you did in the Ohio Valley or the Mississippi Valley. There's no wood for fences. The wind blew all the time. There wasn't any water. And you had to make adjustments. And those who didn't make adjustments failed. In the 1930s, the Dust Bowl came. And Woody Guthrie wrote a song that ought to be the national anthem of the United States, and there isn't any question about it in my mind. This land is your land ought to be the national anthem. And right behind it ought to be a kicker called, So Long It's Been Good to Know Ya. Because that's where everybody was going out to California. And one guy by the name of Jed Clampett hit a damn oil well outside of Beverly Hills. We are out of here. <laughs> Thank you.